Jonah chapter number four. Um, I'm going to have you stand. Would you stand and let's. We know that Jonah has an attitude problem. We're going to look at that again. Not focus on his attitude problem, but we know he does have an attitude problem. It's interesting how God closes this book because he closes the book by highlighting a specific truth or a specific characteristic about himself. God is going to highlight a specific characteristic about himself that he wants us to understand. Are you with me? And so as we read our text out loud, I want to see if you can identify what God is trying to highlight about himself that he wants you to understand. Got it? Let's begin in verse 4, chapter 4, verse number 4. Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? Again, Jonah has an attitude problem. Look, look here. He's got an attitude problem because his perspective is, not, is driven by the flesh at the moment. Yep. Verse 5, so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. And there made he him, him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. We looked at last week. He's wasting his time here. He already knows what's going to happen. That's why he was angry. God's going to give these people mercy. He knows that they repented. And anger will cause you to waste a bunch of time. Verse 6. And the Lord God prepared a gourd, made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. Hallelujah. We can appreciate that here, right? Most people, when you're going to a store, most people in other parts of the country, you go to a store, you're going to look for the closest parking spot. But in the summertime here in Arizona, you'll park a mile away just to get that last shaded spot. We're glad for the shade, and this is where Jonah's at. He's glad for the gourd, getting them some shade. Verse 7. But God prepared a worm. And the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. It came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared. Hope you're paying attention. A vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, and he fainted, and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? He's addressing now Jonah a second time for his anger issues. And he said, I do well to be angry, even to death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast pity on the gourd. For the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much cattle? You're standing still. Hold on a minute before you sit down. What aspect is God trying to highlight about himself that he wants you to understand? Mercy. Certainly mercy would be there. Someone said preparation. What would bring you to that understanding that God is trying to highlight the things he prepared? What would give you that clue? Someone talk to me as specific. Because it said prepared three times in verse, said it once in verse 6, a new prepared in verse 7, and a new prepared in verse number 8. I want to speak to you on this subject. Preparation 
and perspective. Preparation and perspective. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Verse number six, God prepared a gourd. Verse number seven, God prepared a warm. Verse number eight, God prepared vehement heat. A Sonoran desert blast during the summer. These closing verses of Jonah show us that God is deliberately involved in the circumstances of Jonah's life. God is deliberately involved. Now, Jonah didn't look at the gourd and automatically say, this is God. Jonah didn't look at the worm that showed up the next day and say, this is God. Jonah didn't feel that hot wind from the east blowing on his face and say this is God but God lets us know this is God preparing specific circumstances God is intentionally intervening in Jonah's life engineering specific circumstances to address something specific in Jonah that he wants to change I want to point out three things about the specific preparation that God was doing in Jonah's life. I want you to notice first, I want you to notice the intentional activity of divine preparation. Again, the verses specifically tell us that God was intentionally intervening in these circumstances Verse 6 and 7 show us that God did three specific things in a row to affect Jonah's circumstances. But uh, this is actually not the first time that God is highlighting in this book that he is doing some preparation. Go back to chapter 1 and verse number 4. Chapter 1, verse number 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea. God did that as a response to a problem Jonah was having. What was the problem? Jonah was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. And so God involves himself in the circumstances of Jonah through a sea. And then notice chapter 1, verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And so here is a second time in chapter 1 where God is highlighting, again, I'm involving myself in Jonah's circumstances because I'm trying to do something in the life of Jonah. Chapter 2 and verse number 10. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon dry land. A third time where God is highlighting that he is specifically involved in Jonah's circumstances because he's trying to do something in Jonah. Then we get to chapter 4, number, not even focusing on chapter 3. God was involved in the circumstances of Jonah's life and the Ninevites and sending Jonah to Nineveh after he gave him a second command to go. And then chapter 4, three times it uses the specific word, prepared the greek word um the, the not the greek word the hebrew word i think is i'm shooting off the cuff i didn't have it on my notes is uh what's the word for manna i think the hebrew word is mana actually and i thought oh that's like manna here's what it actually means to number and so what God is doing is he's numbering all the uh, circumstances and going through. When someone's numbering something, he's going through and you're numbering things. That means you're specifically involved, you're specifically aware, you're specifically active in whatever it is that you're engaging in. 
And this is showing us that God is specifically involved in Jonah's life, and he's preparing specific circumstances. And the reason he's doing that, we're going to get to in a minute. But if you're in tune, you're already aware why God is doing this. You know that not just in this book, but all throughout the scripture, you see the same thing at play that God is intentionally involved and active preparing circumstances in the lives of his people. Did you know that? Can I just give you a couple of examples here? You've heard about this guy named Moses. Have you heard about him? Say amen if you've heard about Moses. It says in Exodus 4 and verse 21, And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return... Look, and I had so many examples, I just chose one from Moses' life. When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. But I, I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. Here God is informing. Now in Jonah, he he didn't immediately see with the gourd and the worm and the east wind. He didn't know that that necessarily was coming from God. But here God tells Moses, I'm involved in your circumstances. I'm telling you in advance how Pharaoh is going to respond when I send you to him. I've prepared his heart, Pharaoh's heart. I've made his heart hard. How about Joseph? Have you heard about the man Joseph? Say amen if you've heard about Joseph. Look at Psalms and verse 105, verse 17. He, speaking of God, sent a man before them. So this is showing that God is sending Joseph off with a specific purpose to be sold as a what? God was behind this. Now, we can point our fingers at his brothers, and his brothers certainly are guilty, but God's behind this whole thing. Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. How about Elijah? You heard about that guy? God was pretty involved in his circumstances too. 1 Kings 17 and verse number 3, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan, Jordan, and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Let me just time out and tell you something that's not in my notes. I hope... President Biden, I'm not making a political statement. <coughs> Clarification. Demarion, am I making a political statement? No. I hope President Biden doesn't get reelected. Do you know why? I, I want to be respectful as God says so, but I mean, would it be fair to say he, it's not like he's really making strategic moves in the economy? But even if President Biden gets reelected, God's going to take care of me. Amen. He's going to take care of me. You know how I know that? Because if God can take Elijah during a famine and say, I'm going to take care of you. I'll use ravens to feed you. And God's going to take care of me. I've heard during my tenure here more than one person complain about how much money they have lost all because of Biden, Biden, and Biden, and Biden. And certainly, if you have investments, you probably have lost a good chunk of change. You know what you should probably do with that? You should probably complain and worry and gripe. That's what you should probably do. Just go ahead, complain, worry, and gripe. Okay, then the other thing, the only other option to do is to say, man, I don't like losing money. Who does? I hate losing money. 
I can lose $1 and I can be okay. I can go on about my business. My wife loses $1. She can't think about anything else until she finds that $1. You just trust God and you serve God. And you know that even though you may not like losing 5,000, 50,000, 500,000, a million, multi-millions in the economy because of Biden, God is in control. And if he can take care of Elijah and he can take care of Moses and he can take care of whoever the widow woman from Zarephath. I mean, if he can turn five loaves into two fish, then he can take care of you. Yeah, I, that, yeah. Oh, you're listening, okay? I did that on purpose. Five loaves and two fish and uh, enough food for 5,000. Is that better? Do I pass the Bible test? Do I need to... Would, uh, send back my diploma from Heartland Baptist Bible College. <laughs> Seriously, God, God was involved in Elijah's life and he took care of him when everyone else was starving. How about David? Let me show you David's life. Second Samuel and verse 24. I'm sorry, chapter 24, verse 15. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel. Without giving you the context, this is because David numbered God's people when he shouldn't have. It was out of pride and, and ego, he, his ego has been egotized, if we go back from last week. And so uh, sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning, uh, even to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan unto Beersheba, 70,000 men. Verse 17. And David spake unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned, I have done wickedly. So, so God is directly involved in the circumstances of David's life. Let me just give you one more. Daniel, have you heard about Daniel? Daniel chapter 6, verse 21, when he refused to bow down. I can't remember if it's because he refused to bow down or uh, to the image or it was because he determined to pray three times a day when they commanded uh, no prayer to be made. I can't remember which one of those two. So they threw him in the lion's den. And Daniel said unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth, and they have not hurt me. I still can't get over that I can think. I don't want to get over that. You know the scapula is one of the, isn't that right? One of the, scapula is one of the hardest bones to break. That's what the doctor told me. One of the hardest to break. I mean, this whole side upper body broken. And yet, without a helmet, I walk away from a mountain with a little black eye and a mild concussion. I, I honestly believe, just like the God involved himself with Elijah, with the ravens, and Moses hardening Pharaoh's heart, and David, uh, God was involved in David's life and sent a pestilence, uh, that, that God was there. That day when I was foolish and going blazing down the mountain and he protected me, my God was involved in those circumstances. I'm convinced of it. And, and you know this already. You know this. And, and so I, I'm just trying to highlight how, how God is involved in our lives. The, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, he's involved in our lives. And God, he will involve himself in your workplace. God will involve himself in the circumstances of your home. God will involve himself in the times when you're not doing what you should. And he'll be at work in those circumstances. God will be at work 
when you're on the operation table, God will be at work with your possessions and finances. He'll use circumstances. God will be at work with your schedule. He can purposely prepare certain things to try to get your attention. He does this all the time. That's the first thing I wanted to show you. The second thing I want to show you about his preparation is the purposeful goal of divine preparation. Verse 6 is interesting. Did you notice verse 6? Let's look at it again. Are you looking at it? And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his what? Grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. This states that God prepared the gourd in order to comfort Jonah from his grief. Did I read that right? That's what it says right here. He wanted to provide comfort for Jonah. If you just read verse 6, you might think, oh, how sweet. God cares for us and wants to comfort you. And that's so nice. Oh, bless your heart. It's from a few weeks ago, right? The woman from Nashville. If you read this verse as a standalone verse, you would conclude possibly that God's in the business of rescuing of rescuing you from your discomfort. That's what he did to Jonah. Jonah was hot. The sun was beaming down upon his head, his body. He was in grief, sweating, thirsty. God said, ah, I see that you have some grief. I see those little sweat bubbles falling down. I'm going to prepare a gourd and it's going to cover you. To comfort you so you're not in grief. God did that to provide relief from the grief. That's a good little title right there, huh? So if you read this verse alone, you might conclude that God is in the business of just rescuing us from our grief and discomfort. God doesn't want us to be uncomfortable. I was hoping for a greater response than what you just gave me. Do you know what you just gave me? <laughs> the context of this passage, context meaning not just verse 6, but the entire chapter, the, the entire section that we read, both the context of this passage and the scriptures at large demonstrate that God is more concerned about your character than he is your comfort. Do you know that? God was willing to make Joseph extremely uncomfortable by having his brothers gang up on him. Who, who sent him to be a slave? Who did that? No, 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 no. Who ultimately did that? Do I need to go back and show you the verse from Psalms 105? Look at it. Psalms, bring that up. He, God, sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant. Who did that? Who made Joseph to be sold as a servant? Who did that? God did that. That, if you go back and you read Genesis the Bible speaks of Joseph. In fact, it might even be there in Psalms where he cried out in grief and in despair to his brothers saying, please don't do this. There was grief and despair there. And then his father was in grief and despair. And God was willing to make Joseph extremely uncomfortable, not for a day, not for a week, not for a month, not for a year, but for years. Many commentators believe at least 10 years for years because after uh, he was sold as a slave, then he got lied about and thrown in jail. You know about that story. Then he got forgotten when he helped the, either the butler or the baker uh, have his job restored and his life preserved from the wrath of the king and and so god 
made Joseph uncomfortable for years. You know why? He's more concerned about his character than he is his comfort. See, listen. See, God wanted to produce a character in Joseph so that Joseph could be the kind of leader that would be willing to fulfill the will of God, the work of God, and do it ethically. So God was willing to add discomfort to build his character. Verse 7 and 8 of our passage removes any doubt that God's greater purpose in preparing the gourd was not Jonah's comfort. God prepared the gourd. Do you know why God prepared the gourd? Not so just Jonah would do this. Oh, man, that's great. Only to take it away from him to make him more uncomfortable then purposely turned up the thermostat with the east wind. God deliberately prepared this discomfort in Jonah's circumstances for one purpose and one purpose only. Please get this. To motivate Jonah to change his attitude and his perspective that was not reflective of God's. He says to Jonah, Jonah... I gave you this score so you would rejoice over it. So then I could contrast how you would despair over the, the, the gourd being destroyed. But you don't care at all if I were to destroy 120,000 people in Nineveh. A person is far more valuable than a plant. And Jonah, the reason that I'm working in your circumstances with the gourd and with the worm and with the heat is because I see an attitude in you. I see a perspective in you that does not reflect who I am. And I want to change it in you. And so I'm going to create some discomfort to help motivate change. Amen. And amen. That's why he's working in these circumstances here. It's very simple. I want you to notice the, oh, let me say this. Jonah hasn't resolved this attitude problem, right? He could have resolved it early on. And so God says, let me help you resolve it by preparing you these circumstances. I want you to notice this uh, take-home truth that we can draw from this passage. Would you look at, oh, there it is. The purpose of God preparing specific circumstances in your life is to help adjust and correct your heart to reflect his perspective. He uses circumstances all the time. God did this to Mary. I forgot to tell you to don't lose your place in Jonah. Would you hop over to John 11? Don't lose your place in Jonah. John 11. God did this to Mary and Martha when they were struggling to have the right perspective about the problem of their brother. Mary and Martha loved God. John 11. Let's, we won't read the whole story. Let me just highlight a couple of verses here. Uh, Mary and Martha, their brother Lazarus, had died when they sent for Jesus, Lazarus hadn't died yet. It took a day for them to send servants from where they were in Bethany up to where Jesus was in the region of Jordan. It took a day. Jesus stayed two days after hearing, and then it took another day for Jesus to travel. That means four days. Lazarus would have died after the servants went to go tell, find Jesus. And so Jesus is going to show up four days late. You're familiar with this story, chapter 11, verse number 3. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for what? You know what he's saying right there? If Jesus is looking on these circumstances where Lazarus is made sick, and he's saying that this is not going to end in death, here's why this is going on. 
I want to get glory to myself. I have some purposes. And he can see in Mary and Martha's heart, he can see that though they're people of faith, they haven't reached the ceiling of their faith. I want you to get this. They haven't reached the ceiling of their faith. So when Jesus shows up, do you know what, you know what Martha's going to say? What verse is it? If you had been here, Jesus, my brother would what? What verse is that? Verse 21. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Before she ever said that, Jesus said this. I'm using this to elevate your faith so I can get greater glory. You know, sometimes maybe God might be adding greater difficulty to your life simply to elevate the ceiling of your faith. Did you, you ever stop and think about that? Maybe it's not really about uh, the person who you're frustrated with. Maybe it's not really about your finances. Maybe it's really not about the difficulty in your family. Maybe it's really not about a, a mean boss or a, a crazy neighbor. Maybe it's really not about your health. Maybe God is doing these things so he can get glory, and he's going to get glory by elevating your faith because your faith still has room to grow. That's what he was doing in Martha's heart. Heart. How do I know that? Verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believe in me, uh, believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Then he asked her a simple question. Do you believe this, Martha? Notice what Martha says in response. Look at it. What's the next verse? Is that verse 25? What's the next verse? What does she say? Yes, Lord, what? You know what she does? She avoids the question. I believe that you're the Christ. I mean, if I'm Jesus, I'm not. But if I'm Jesus, I'm like, is that the question I asked you? I just told you that I possess all power for life and death. So that if a man be dead, if he can believe in me, he can live. And I asked you, do you believe I can bring your four-day-old dead brother back to life? I just asked you if you believe that. And you didn't answer my question. You know what Jesus is trying to do to her? Elevate her faith. I believe he probably accomplished that goal after he goes to the grave. You know, there's a big crowd around. Jesus walks up to the grave. What does he do? Someone talk to me. What does he do? Three simple words. Three simple words. Lazarus, come forth. You've got to know that the silence was deadening. Because he's still wrapped up in the grave clothes. And he's inside the grave. They're not inside the grave. They're outside the grave. They just heard Jesus say, Lazarus come forth and everyone's just like oh. he comes wobbling out. they had to unwind him Jesus is the control of these circumstances more concerned about their character than their comfort because he's trying to elevate their faith do you know why God is involved in the circumstances of your life and sometimes adds difficulty to your life? Because there's a character and perspective that's not reflective of who he is or his truth that he's trying to get you to embrace. And so he's going to motivate you to change your perspective, to agree with him, to agree with uh, his word instead of being stubborn, and, and to reflect 
his perspective and that circumstances. And sometimes God has to do that the hard way by allowing difficulties or frustrations to come into your life to try to get our attention. And so that's what he'll do often times. And again, listen, he'll do this in our place of work. And if there's difficult circumstances at your workplace, this story might lead you to consider, maybe he's doing that to try to teach me something. Sometimes he does this in our home. You can point your finger at everyone else. Point your finger at your kids. Point your finger at your mom, your dad. Dog. But, but maybe, maybe God is doing this because there is an attitude in you or a perspective in you that is not reflective of who God is or his truth. And so he's trying to add pressure and discomfort to get you to change that perspective. Maybe he's doing that with some of your possessions and finances, and you're just frustrated. It's like one thing going wrong after another. One, one uh, money market account or uh, financial account after another that seems to uh, be losing money or uh, uh, renters destroying your property or destroying something in your home. And so sometimes God can do this to help motivate a perspective i don't need necessarily good tenants or joe biden to get out of the office and trump to come in the office for me to know that my finances are secure not because of the nasdaq not because of the s p 500 but because the god who controls all of that is my god he loves me he's my father Amen. so i'm good I just have this in my notes. I don't have anyone in particular in mind. Sometimes God does this with people who love a schedule. Love a schedule. Everything's planned. I got Monday through Friday planned out. I got my next two years planned out. I know where I'm going on vacation in 2027. I'm not saying I do. I'm just saying there's people out there like that. All planned out, just right there. Sometimes God will purposely frustrate people. And by the way, planning is a good thing. Let me just qualify that. That's a good thing. You should plan. You should try to organize your schedule. But you need to make sure you have a right balance on that. And God will take people who have a an unbalanced confidence or reliance on their success and efficiency in life on a schedule, and he'll completely throw in a wrench with the schedule and watch you do this. Get like Jonah. Just you're, you're, you get, I can't believe they canceled on me. I can't believe that happened. I can't believe that. It's all these things not going right way. The people don't care about a schedule. Well, God cares about your attitude and your perspective. Maybe he's doing this. So you'll just say, I planned this out, but ultimately God's sovereign. And I'm pretty sure he's got this in control. So I'll just choose to be careful for nothing. Can I give you the last thing? And then we're going to go home. The individual reality of divine preparation. What God did in Jonah's life and in Moses' life and in Joseph's life and in David's life and in Daniel's life and in Martha's life and in Peter's life and Bartholomew's life and James' life and Judas's life and Esther's life, I mean, do I need to go on? He wants to do and is doing in, say it for me, 
in your life. You need to know this truth. You need to know this truth. God will purposely prepare specific circumstances in your life to help adjust and correct your heart to reflect his perspective. Sometimes it's really hard to have the right perspective, yes or no? Even the best of saints have a hard time having the right perspective. Even the best of saints. Paul was like that. He had a bad perspective over John Mark, and God had to adjust that. David had a bad perspective uh, certain times over certain things. And I think God understands our struggle to have the right perspective. Please hear me. I think God understands that. Would you show the verse? Uh, I believe it's Psalms 103. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. That next verse is so awesome. Because he knows all you are is living dirt. That's all you are. Living dirt. <laughs> he knows our frame. He knows we have fragile emotions that have these great fluctuations. He knows we're prone to cognitive instabilities that is vulnerable and affected by many things. He does understand this. Please get this. He does understand when you struggle to have a perspective. He does. But he never justifies it. Never justifies it. This is why he purposely prepares circumstances because he knows that sometimes we get stuck in this rut of a bad attitude or stuck in a rut of a ungodly, unspiritual perspective. And so he tries to help reshape our perspective, to adjust our attitude, to reflect his character, his goodness, his truth, his forgiveness, his peace, his satisfaction, his determination to move forward. So he'll use circumstances to try to motivate and manipulate our flawed attitude and flawed perspectives. He does this all the time. So what this specifically means for you is that you must know, you must know that your circumstances have either been specifically prepared or specifically allowed to help shape how you think, to help shape your attitude so it would reflect the glory of God whether you eat or drink or whatsoever ye do. It's such a big deal that, that God gave us that verse. Whether ye eat. You would have thought that God would have, if I was writing the Bible, I would have said whether you go to church or you're getting married. Because those are really important things, yes or no. But he wanted to show e even the everyday things that are repeated that you don't think much of. Eating and drinking should be done in a way that reflects my glory and my truth no matter what you're doing. And I understand when you struggle. I understand because I know your frame because I made you. So to help you when you struggle, I just might turn up the heat in your life a little bit. Sometimes I might add a time of ease in your life. And you might misunderstand that I'm actually blessing you because you've been good. I'm only setting you up to take that away or to radically alter the circumstances afterwards to rock you, to reveal that you don't have an attitude or a character, a perspective that reflects who I am. So be careful. So God will do this to us all the time, all the time. Knowing this, there is really knowing that God's involved in our circumstances. Yes or no, yes. right? I'm trying to be done. 
knowing this, there is no reason really ever to complain or to ever get bent out of shape. Isn't that right? If he's involved in all my circumstances and he uses all my circumstances to shape my mind and my perspective to reflect his glory, if he does that, then why would I complain? What point is there to get all bent out of shape? In fact, when you do get bent out of shape, it means that you're being like Jonah and you're not reflecting a character and an attitude that reflects the glory of God. When you get bent out of shape over something, over circumstances, you're just telling God, I need you to continue to add difficulty to my life until I rectify my attitude or my perspective. God will purposely prepare specific circumstances in your life to help adjust and correct your heart to reflect his perspective. And because of that, I can be careful for nothing and be thankful for everything. Amen and amen. Now, here's how I want to close. I want to show you just a, a short video this comes from John Piper. It's a song that I love. It's called, Though He Slay Me. Now, you're not going to listen to this song, but in the middle of this song, John Piper has this one-minute monologue that touched my heart when I heard this. I heard this right after. I heard this while I'm recovering in the hospital, and it touched me. God used it. And so this is going to be the way we close. As soon as the video is done, there'll be some music, and I'll give you a chance to pray. Let's play that video at this time. Not only is all your affliction momentary, not only is all your affliction light in comparison to eternity and the glory there, but all of it is totally meaningful. Every millisecond, of your pain from the fallen nature or fallen man, every millisecond of your misery in the path of obedience is producing a peculiar glory you will get because of that. I don't care if it was cancer or criticism. I don't care if it was slander or sickness. It wasn't meaningless. It's doing something. It's not meaningless. Of course you can't see what it's doing. Don't look to what is seen. When your mom dies, when your kid dies, when you've got cancer at 40, when a car creams into the sidewalk and takes her out, don't say, it's meaningless. It's not. It's working for you an eternal weight of glory. Therefore, therefore, do not lose heart, but take these truths and day by day focus on them. Preach them to yourself every morning. Get alone with God and preach His Word into your mind until your heart sings with confidence that you are new and cared. Give you a chance to do business with the Lord. Guitar is playing, no need for the piano. You want to do business right there in your chair. Confident that the Lord would use a message like this to speak to your heart. So I'll give you a few moments to do business with the Lord.
Father, thank you that you're involved in our life, not just a little bit, but in every detail. Because of that, we know that um, we can trust that um, your plan is at work to mold us and make us and help us and equip us no matter what we're facing. Just remind us of this the next time we find ourselves like Jonah, frustrated or angry or displeased because of the way things are working. May we look up and then may we look on the inside and wonder what you may want to change or adjust in us. We thank you for your goodness. We ask it in Christ's name. Everyone said.